This is the Rebel Author Podcast, where we talk about books, business, and occasionally bad words. Hello, Rebels, and welcome back to the Rebel Author Podcast, episode 24. Today's episode is a special one because it is with not one guest, but two. I'm talking to Beck and Andrew Brown. Beck and Andrew run a family uh, owned and run design company called Design for Writers. And if you haven't already guessed, they are cover designers. And they also do other things like website design and all kinds of things that you will hear about soon. Today, we'll be talking about how to get the best uh, out of your cover design, your cover designer, and how to work with designers, and also what to watch out for when working with freelancers and designers. But first to last week's question. Last week's question was, what is the best book you've read this year? Ritu said a memoir written by a mother and son team, uh, a co-author team, uh, about his uh, depression journey called The Boy Between by Amanda Prowse and her son Josh Hartley, which isn't out until later in the year, so she was very lucky and got an arc. Amy says, I think the best book by far has been Wired for Story. I have learned, uh, and that's by Lisa Cron. Um, I have learned so, 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 so much from that book. Um, and she also took a course which she mentions uh, she's also learned loads from. I own this book and it has been on my pile of to read for an obscenely long time. So I am going to shove it up um, higher up the pile and try and get to it uh, this year. I mean, I literally have a pile of about 20 books next to my bed. Um, so I just need to speed up. I've been very slow. I'm a bit behind with my reading goals this year. Jeff Kidder says the best book this year has been uh, The Natural History of Dragons and the rest of the trilogy. This week's question is a bit more of a fun question. I want you to get all opinionated and uh, ranty for me. So this week's question is, should you judge a book by its cover? The book recommendation this week is Smoke Gets In Your Eyes by Caitlin Doherty. Doherty? Doherty, I think it is. Um, I have been listening to the audio book of this book. Now, I will give some caveats and some warnings. This book is about uh, death and working in a crematorium. And um, there are some graphic explanations in there. Now, to, to explain, I always, I have a deep fascination with death and the philosophy of of it, the reality of it, the emotion of it, the rituals behind it. And I do a lot of research because um, it is a theme that often runs through my uh, fiction. So that is why I am listening to that book. And just, you know, if it's a, um, a raw subject emotionally for anybody, I don't recommend you read this book. Um, but if you are, you know, more on the um, interest side of, of reading, more about death and learning more about uh, you know rituals and, and crematoriums and things and I highly recommend it it is fascinating and mind-blowing and I will include links in the show notes to that in personal news this week I I don't really know what happened um, I will be honest and say um, it's very up and down uh, which I'm assuming it probably is for most people at the moment um, it's quite hard to get a routine because obviously we can't have our usual routine and the days are very much blending into one another and it's you know more than normal I'm not realizing what day it is what time of day it is um, and you know we are doing some homeschooling and and so it's difficult. Our six year old is up and down as well. Um, but what it is meaning is that the time I do get to write, I am really, really focusing and uh, getting getting my work done. And uh, one thing that I wanted to mention is that in my Facebook group, which is newly named Rebel Authors, um, so if you go to Facebook and you search for Rebel Authors and you click groups, you will be able to find me. Um, we, I am doing daily writing sprints live at the moment. So if you would like um, some uh, company, some, um, you know, yeah, company basically, whilst you're writing some accountability, then do hop into my writing group. There 
there are going to be some fun sessions where some gin may or may not be involved um but I'll put a schedule up next week. Uh, we also have guests. We had the amazing Dan Wilcox from the Great Writer Share podcast. Um, and uh, I've got some other um, writing buddies that I am going to try and rope in next week. Um, so on, on, on the amount of work that I'm getting done, I'm going to be completely honest and say um, this is a crisis period and therefore I can't expect myself to get the same amount of work done that I would normally. So I have not been able to get the transcript done for this episode. Um, the reason is each transcript can take any anything from 40 minutes to two hours to complete um, and with two speakers this time the, the, you know I just there was no way I was going to be able to get this one done and I'm also just going to say outright I am not going to be doing transcripts until um, things go back to normal it, it's just too time consuming and I would it's it's basically a choice of either stop doing the podcast because I can't get it perfect with all of the elements that I want or continue um, as best I can and that means some things have to drop so I'm afraid for now I'm not going to be doing transcripts. Um, in other news though I have now got the Anatomy of Prose pre-order digitally live on pretty much most wide stores now. Um, I'm still waiting for a couple to populate but hopefully by the time this um, goes live they will all be through. Um, I have also ordered paperback proofs so once those arrive um, if they are also taking a little bit longer um, but once those arrive I'm hoping in the next uh, 10 days I will be able to get the paperback uh, pre-order live too. If you would like to order the um, book then you can I will leave a link in the show notes or alternative Alternatively, you can use books, the number two, read.com forward slash anatomy of prose. That's books, the number two, read.com forward slash anatomy of prose. I sent out some arcs last week, uh, those who are going to be giving me blurbs for the back of the hardcover book. Um, I didn't manage to send out all of the arcs. Um, I'm still trying to sort my life out with the um, launch stuff. So those of you who are hoping or expecting arcs, they will be coming hopefully in the next week. Um, and I'm also going to be running a giveaway. So I ordered, um, I printed one additional physical arc, um, which I'm going to annotate and um, just give some extra author thoughts and I'll sign it. Um, so once I've got that giveaway live and set up, I will let you all know. Um, moving on, I last week I did manage to get my audio booth set up uh, with the intention of recording the Anatomy of Prose audiobook, but I had a number of podcast things that happened last week, so I didn't start recording. And um, I'm also trying to decide whether or not doing the audiobook or a course first would be better. Um, uh, the reason I'm wavering is because typically I would record in the mornings for the audiobook, but I can't do that now because the house isn't quiet enough. So it will be recording in the evenings, which is fine, um, but it, just harder because obviously I need to rest at some point. So yeah, I'm interested. What what would you guys be more interested in? Uh, tweet me at Rebel Author Pod or email me or leave a note in the comments. Would you guys be interested in the audiobook or the course first? Obviously both will happen. Um, it's just which one gets done first. Okay, and finally uh, from me, the last chance if you would like to help with the launch of the Anatomy of Prose, be on the street team or read a re review copy. It's literally, I'm, I'm shutting down recruitment um, this week, but if you would like to, um, then you can join by filling out a very short form at bit.ly forward slash AOP team. That's bit.ly forward slash AOP team. So one announcement before we go into the Listener Rebel. I, <laughs> this might be a really bad time to do this given uh, the amount of work that podcasts take. However, um, I am starting a new podcast. 
<laughs> I feel completely bonkers saying this, but um, I am. I'm starting a new podcast, and this time it's not just with me. It is with a co-host. So um, this co-host has been on the Rebel Author Podcast. Um, I am really good friends with Dan Wilcox, and so together we are starting a podcast called Next Level Authors. We think we're launching on the 14th of April, but that is tentative at the moment. We're still um, sort of constructing a few systems and processes in the background and some of the um, stuff that we need. Um, but yeah, we are starting Next Level Authors podcast. And this podcast is basically going to enable us to look at where we are in our author careers and um, look at how we can jump to the next level. So we both want to be six-figure uh, six authors, um, or I want to be, I want a six-figure business. And so, yeah, we're, we're looking at the levels. We're looking at, this isn't really for beginners. This is more for, um, you know, the sort of mid-level. So you've you might have a book, you might have a couple of books, and you're looking to jump your business up the levels. Um, yeah, and each week we will be taking a different thing, breaking it down, looking at how each other does it, um, <laughs> critiquing, I suppose, and uh, yeah, looking at how we can um, help each other and help other people, more importantly, uh, get to the next level in their businesses. More on that um next time and if I can drop a link in the show notes I will otherwise I will do that next time okay listener rebel of the week this week is Amy Sund Amy says when I was younger getting their leather belt was a normal punishment when some was called for usually it was my dad who administered such but one time my mum decided to dish out the punishment herself and I grabbed the belt from her mid-swing and hit her with it before running away outside. She was about eight then and that was the last time her mother ever tried it. It was always the threat of wait until your father gets home after that which makes me giggle. I can't believe you <laughs> whipped the belt away and then smacked your mum with it. That's absolutely hilarious. Um, not that ever getting hit with a belt is hilarious, but um, the fact that you whipped it out of her hand is absolutely hilarious. I'm uh, highly amused. Uh, if you anybody else would like to be a rebel of the week, please do send in your story. It can be any kind of rebellion, big, small, or somewhere in between. And please, please, please do send in those rebellions because um, I'm getting to the point where I only have a few left. So um, we always need to stock up. You can either tweet me at the rebel author pod or you can email your rebel story to rebel author podcast at gmail.com. No new patrons this week, but I wanted to, sp to say an extra especially deep thank you to all of my patrons, especially in this climate and time of uncertainty. I am deeply grateful to all of you who are helping to ensure that this podcast continues. Um, so thank you guys and hopefully you've all seen the message uh, that I am thinking about adding an additional benefit um, in the form of a Discord or Slack potentially channel. I'm not sure yet where we can chat um, when you're at a particular level. If you would like to support the show and get access to all of the bonus posts, essays, content, blooper reels, sneak peeks, previews, and all sorts of goodies, then you can from as little as $2 a month by visiting patreon.com forward slash Sasha Black. And that's Sasha with a C and not an S. Okay, let's get on with this super special episode. Hello and welcome to the Rebel Author Podcast. Today I am so excited by uh, the episode that we are having. I have not one guest, but two. And two people I have been trying to drag onto the podcast for a really long time. I am joined by my cover designers, Andrew and Rebecca Brown. They are an award-winning team behind Design for Writers and have been for more than a decade. We offer, sorry, less than almost a decade. I'll try that again. And they have been uh, the award-winning team behind Design for Writers for almost a decade. We offer services to independent authors, publishers across the globe, people like you who recognise the value of professional author services and want to invest in their writing. 
Since beginning their design company in 2009 and working on thousands of books and websites, they've come to know exactly what writers and publishers need. An exceptional service with professional, affordable design that showcases you and your work in the best way possible. They are book lovers first, regularly found sipping coffee in bookshops while drooling over beautiful book design and casting a critical eye across the latest re- releases. They love fundamentally good classic design and, are, uh, and we love, sorry, and they love working with clients who recognise that value, uh, the, the value that professional design brings to their work. In fact, they feel incredibly fortunate to be a trusted part of the publishing process with their wonderful, wonderful authors. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Sasha. Authors just like you. Yeah, obviously I'm your best customer, but (laughs) (laughs) we won't talk about that today. Dragging us on. Yeah. (laughs) So tell everyone a little bit more about you and your journey how did you guys start what what led you into cover design work and how did you get to where you are today um well, should i start with that yes. yeah okay um it's a bit like a session on the couch actually i right from being a child i was obsessed with um design and graphics particularly typography and layout and grids and things like that um and I just found it really, really beautiful. I'd always get the same books out of the library. We only had three books in the library. And um, I'd have them on re-release and again and on again. design, not just three books in the library full stop. Oh, yeah, we had more than three <laughs> books in the library. We had three, it was a tiny, books. tiny library. <laughs> this is the north of England. We don't have very much. <laughs> yeah. We've got through a <laughs> um, So, yeah, these three design books um, on typography and layout. And I'd just get them out again and again and literally copy them. Um, copy everything in them again and again and then try to think why they were doing that and um, I internalized it all and I got to college and um, on day one of college they dropped my design course <gasps> yeah um, not that he's bitter or anything like yeah. that <laughs> like 20 odd years ago and I'm still bitter so anyway yeah. I went off a different direction I did different things and I worked in the third sector and Beck worked with children um I was generally doing um, events and um, like large scale fundraising and things. Um, but I was really interested in the design and the production side. I'd spend more time on the poster than the event sort of thing. Um, and then eventually in 2009, um, I just thought it's unfinished business and I want to, I want to get back to it. Um, my mum and dad gave me some money to buy my first Mac, which was the first game changer. And um, we bought Adobe Creative Cloud, a proper legit version, for the first time. And um, for about the next year, just was still working full time for another two years. Actually, mm-hmm. um, was up till early hours, kind of practicing and learning everything I could and getting to know the kit, with a plan of eventually taking on some work. And from 2010, I think we started getting some work. And um, always been obsessed with books, both of us. And the layout really lent my interest in layout lends itself to book design and first of all through Twitter we started getting some work through contact back had on Twitter um, and a few jobs and in 2011 which you'll understand we made the leap to go full-time with the business um, which is really like equally scary, scary and exhilarating and terrifying yeah. Um, and yeah we did that in 2011 we had a bit of a like a a safety net. Our parents said they would make up for a little while any gaps in income that we had in that first year, which helped a lot. But by early 2012, it was self-sufficient, and it's generally kind of gone from there. Yeah, the rest is history. Ruff, yeah, roughly a decade now it's been going, one way or another. That's amazing. And I love that your journey into having a you know full-time business echoes what a lot of writers have to do in that mm. they have to stay up until two o'clock in the morning, um, you know, <laughs> try to pound out the words through bleeding eyes and caffeine and all of that stuff. Um, yeah, so I love that you guys followed a very, very similar path. And I think it's wonderful that your parents were also there to support you because, you know, it is so hard and so terrifying. That is one of the scariest things, I think, making that leap from having a you know a guaranteed income at the end of the yeah. month to well what if I don't you know yeah. sell enough <laughs> books or Ten years on we still have that but every month it's going to be well well what if this you've always got a fear of what if the work yeah. doesn't come in because we kind of like we book in two sort of stages we book people 
who book well in advance, and that's probably half the work. I mean, book people who book um, weeks before they need the cover. People who come. I think our furthest booking is you've got some booking for like the year three thousand or something with us. <laughs> yeah, and, probably. Um, <laughs> we have a few people like you, who, which is great for us. Who would like to book well in advance, and others are, you're also going to get people who turn up late and say, "Can you do this?" Mm. Um, and if it, especially if it's existing clients, then you're always trying to fit them in. But you've always got that worry, what if, what if? I don't think that'll ever, ever go away. Well, I can guarantee you're safe with me for a really <laughs> long time. <laughs> um, OK, so let's talk to newer authors who perhaps haven't had a cover designed yet. Can you talk them through the process? So from somebody contacting you initially to them having a completed cover design how does that work for a new author who's starting you and me well i sort of handle inquiries don't i yeah so. we'll just talk uh, over each other yeah yeah it's probably better <laughs> <laughs> um so if someone gets in touch um until maybe the last few years it's all been word of mouth so someone's been passed on our email from someone else and now we've got a contact form on the website where they sort of fill in a bit of preliminary information but um the basic idea. A really beautiful contact form on the website. A really beautiful. <laughs> is it designed well? <laughs> it is, yeah. <laughs> um, so, the first things we kind of need to know off them are sort of basic, well, basics really. So, the genre, um, what format they need, I mean, real basic, what currency they need. You know, we have people all over the world. Um, and we sort of get through that, get them a quote for exactly what they've asked for. I think first, like, as part of like the form and the way the website's set out and things, it's designed to it's a bit self filtering so people might not might realise straight away that we're not for them. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, the this the form is, and the website itself is designed to sort of like be the first part of letting people say, Are these somebody that we want to work with when they get to us rather than wasting their time coming to us or wasting our time responding. Mm-hmm. We now have used to have prices on the website for a long time until about, oh, a year ago, two years ago. Yeah. But then you spend a lot of time with people who are like, oh, that's too high for us, or people who even want to pay higher, because mm-hmm. that happens with people. Um, so, yeah, sorry. No, yeah. Um, so when we've got through all of that and I've sent them out a quote, then we book them in and we open up. We've got this project space, which you know inside out. <laughs> Camp, um, and we'll go through. We have like a design questionnaire, and we'll, we've got loads of questions where we try and get at different aspects of their book. So, it, some of the questions might seem similar to each other, but they are just slightly different because it lets you get a different kind of handle on where they're coming from. Um, obviously, we can't read every single book, we would love to, but we would never get any work done. Um, so, it's a way of sort of finding out what they think their book is about. Um, what are the key aspects to draw out of it? And those questions genuinely have been developed over the years. Kind yeah. of, we had a set of questions when we started that we'd work with people on, and then some of them have gone, some of them have been adjusted, tweaked, and we just found that like those questions they get to lot, the heart of it. We have a lot of authors who say after they filled out the questionnaire, it's made them think about some aspects of the book that they'd never considered before. Yeah. Um, so that that's always quite good to hear. There's a lot of people say that, isn't there? Yeah, you've never. <laughs> Sasha, but... <laughs> well, I can only give out so many compliments. Um, <laughs> have, have you got a couple of examples of the questions, just so that uh, listeners might understand? You know, um, so well, I'll tell you one of my favourite questions. Yeah. Whilst you're thinking about some of them, one of the questions that I think is uh, really important is you ask me, "What do I not want to see on the cover?" Yeah, yeah. and I think that's really important because. It's all good and well knowing what you do want, but if you don't know what you don't want and you don't tell your designer that, then, yeah. you know, that could end up you know, causing multiple iterations or, you know, having to start from scratch. So I think that's one of the questions that I uh, I both like the best and makes me think the most. But I don't know if you have a couple of other examples. Well, that one in, that actually really good, came yeah. from painful experience early on where um, we didn't ask that question or go off and... Like, oh, wow, really nailed this. Go back, and the client's like, oh, but I don't like X. <laughs> I never yeah. mentioned that. Yeah. And they had no reason to mention that because we weren't asking them the question. Yeah. Um, so that's a good example. And it ties into one of the most important ones for me when I'm doing the design is the target market question. Mm. Um, yeah. Because, if again, it's about knowing what you're not aiming at. And a lot, well, not a lot of times, but often clients first answer them 
the everyone. <laughs> That's great, but it's not going to happen. Um, you're never going to be able to aim your book at everyone. And you, your books, um, your podcast, you're targeted really well. There are people who might not like your style. <laughs> Crazy people. <laughs> <laughs> but there are. And But you can't spend your time worrying about the people who won't like it. You can't, you're not ever going to reach the entire world with anything that you do. Mm. So being able to narrow it down and say, this is who I'm targeting that. Design for writers, as an example, we could have just done a general design business, but we love books. We target that writers. We wouldn't have found the clients that we found if we'd been trying to hit everyone. Mm. Um, so that's a really important question for me. Yeah. Okay. So they filled out... Um... They filled out your um, questionnaire and you know now all of the information about their book. What happens next? It is kind of, it's, it's not just, just to sort of elaborate on that, it's not just a questionnaire where they just fill it in and we come back with concepts. There is like back and forth yeah. on that. So if they have sort of said, we like having people on, we'll probably come back and say, okay, so what people? <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's meant to be like a collaborative thing between like you Sasha, the writer, and us. Um, so yeah, that should lead to a bit of discussion on some of the questions. Some of them that'll be the end of the discussion, but then it generally leads to discussion on some of the questions, which tend to be the ones once that discussion gets going, are where the answer lies to how the book cover should look. Mm. Um, but then yeah, after that, um, we go away and we do the research, and we both do the research kind of individually. We'll look at it separately, and then we'll bring that together. Yeah, because we'll, we'll each have like different. Like takes. takes on what the author means, and it's quite good to sort of bring that together. And, and I've got to say, although I do the sort of like most of the cover design, you the layout design. Um, a lot of the time, when an author will say at the end, "Ah, oh, that was a really good take that I never saw, or I never thought of," it's often been Beck who's come up with that take because you've got a really good eye for a good image or mm-hmm. a good for, for the cover. Um, so you get probably, the glory, and I get the glory. <laughs> um, All your dirty that, secrets are being revealed now. <laughs> Um, but then after that, after the research is done, um, I kind of go in and it's only at that point when we'll turn on Photoshop and I'm not really one for planning a design. Um, I like it to be, I don't, um, organic, if that makes sense. Um, I, I think I try planning by sitting down, I'll have this here, that there, I'll find this image for here. But I just found that led to arbitrary decisions and you end up locking yourself into things, which if you just get in there and start playing around and get a feel for the cover, it comes together much more naturally, I've always found. So that's the way I prefer to design. That is fascinating. So I suspect then if you were a, if you were a, write, a writer, you would be a pantser or, or you would um, <laughs> you would write into the dark, as some people call it. They're, you know, they, those are the writers who don't plot particularly. They uh, they just go in and, and get down and dirty uh, with, with the words. I think that's fascinating. I never thought about whether or not designers had to plan or go in and just do. I think, yeah, that's... Two camps. There's definitely those who love to plan. And in some ways, I'd love to be those ones. Um, because it always feels on from the outside looking in like, oh wow, it's it's so organised. But I've tried it, and I just feel like my designs come together better when I can get a feel for the cover as I'm working on it. And I mean, you spend a bit more time trying things out that don't work, but just something seems to happen organically when I'm doing that in a way that it doesn't the other way around. So yeah, mm. and then we present the concept. Sorry, um, and depending on what package someone's chosen. Um, either a single concept or two, or I think in our most expensive package it's four. Um, and we'll select one that they prefer, and then we'll work on that with them to get it just right. Perfect. Yeah, as they want that. Amazing. Um, and so just because obviously indie authors can have multiple formats now. So they, you know, they, yeah. I'm, we're talking predominantly here about ebook, but obviously there are paperback and hardback and audio. So what are the differences? So you've got your ebook cover now that's been signed off. What happens then if somebody also wants a paperback? How does that work? Well, first of all, what's changed, which has surprised us, is over the past two years, more people want I thought ebook only would become more and more the thing. It's gone the other way. Yeah. Um, most people want the full set, often more, from more than one printer. Um, some people, I don't know if this is experience others would share, um, I would say only 15% maybe, top of my head, want ebook only. Yeah. So generally, it's the other way around. The main process 
ebook. But what I will say is, whether it's ebook or full print cover, it still gets exact, basically the same process. Yeah. Um, we don't do less research, less design work on an ebook um, than we do on a print cover. Obviously, we have to design the spine and the back to match if we do that. But in terms of advanced planning and preparation, it's pretty much the same process, really. I think one of the differences is with the print book, you kind of need to know from the beginning what the trim size is going to be. Otherwise, you can end up laying it out, and then yeah. you've got to shrink it down or make it bigger, and that can just throw off the whole composition. And for and those thing, who uh, don't know what trim size is, can you just explain what trim size means? Yeah, sure. It's just the physical height and breadth of your book, the height and width. Yeah, so like you often get like a 6 by 9 or 5 by 8 uh, It depends really what sort of book you do, and generally it will be a different trim size. It's sort of a different format that would best suit your book. Yeah. yeah. Generally, if we're doing something non-fiction, it'll be more towards the bigger side, and fiction tends more towards the smaller trim sizes. Great. Um, but one thing, because um, I think there's a lot of bad advice out there to authors about designing for ebook, which is tends to be to assume you should throw all of the good design principles out the window mm-hmm. just because ebook is this great new thing. It is a great new thing. Um, but where all we have to do is make it pop, make it pop, <laughs> make it pop at an inch tall and thing. And if you if you go with a good design, like ebooks haven't set aside all the principles of design, they still have to work within those. And if you design something really well, design a good cover that's going to work for you in print, you need that cover to make someone cross a room in a bookstore anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, like. Yeah, a single image with Comic Sans writing is going to pop. That doesn't make it a good design. Yeah. It's just that I have seen that advice from different people at different times when I read blogs and I just think it's wrong because good design is good design. It has brought new elements, new considerations in that you have to bear in mind. So maybe design generally for books now is different than it would have been before your books. Um, and you can see that if you look back over designs. Um, but bearing that in mind still, you have you have basic principles of design which you should keep in mind, whether you design for ebook or print or both. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, um, and just, just to add to that, we are, I am hoping that everybody listening is um, not di- designing covers themselves unless they are qualified or, you know, trained designers because um, good a good cover will sell your book and a bad cover most certainly will not. So I'm not, I, I'm hoping that there aren't indie authors out here who are just going to slap a cover together. You know, we are, you should be going out and paying for a good quality book cover because it is, if not the most, it is one of the most important factors in your marketing. Um, okay, so l- talking about marketing w- um, and, you know, understanding covers and their genres, what what should writers do before contacting you? What do they need to know uh, before emb- embarking on the cover design process in order to get the, the most and the best out of the cover design process? I would say, honestly, the first thing to do whether it's us or someone else, is to contact a cover designer. Not not to have too much, not to spend, because we do have a lot of information we can help with. We can answer a lot of questions. And sometimes that leads to, we'll have back and forth with potential clients and they go elsewhere, and that's fine. That's, that's part of what you expect. But we can answer genuinely a lot of questions. We have a lot of information we can give people that otherwise you might be up at two o'clock in the morning going down a rabbit hole on Reddit trying to find the answer to something. When you could just ask a cover designer, um, and we can get, so come to us early. It helps us to know if we've got the work booked in advance as well, obviously. But we can help with questions. Um, and we have we have a treasure trove of information we can give to people, which we're trying to figure out ways of making that public so it's not just us responding to people. We're trying to figure out ways of doing that now. But come to us early, ask the questions, fa- come to whoever early, find a cover designer that you're comfortable with, and then... I, I just think you'll have a lot more time you can spend on your writing and a lot less time worrying about what trim size to pick. Yeah, and what a trim size is and things like that. Yeah. Should authors come with some kind of um, opinions on what they like and don't like, what yeah. what they should expect in their genre, though? Are those kinds of things, are those the sorts of things that they should at least come having, you know, done some yeah, looking at their genre? Yeah, absolutely. Once, so maybe it's like a different point of view I'm looking at but once they are booked in with us um then we definitely encourage you to start thinking about your specific books um and 
when you come to answer the questions, you don't have to answer the questions immediately. The questions that we have, you can go away, research them. But yeah, like we want to hear your ideas. We want to know what you think works in your genre, what you think doesn't work, like you were saying. We want to know you know everything about your book in a way that we never can. Mm. Um, so it's probably good to have a look at a designer's website and have a look at their portfolio and do you like the covers that are there? Even if they're not exactly your genre, do you like basically what they do? Yeah. Um, so in that sense, yeah, it's quite helpful to have an idea of your dislikes and dislikes. Um, okay. I, I, yeah. I, would, no, I would definitely say bring your ideas and we discuss those because we're kind of like here to advise and to execute on the design. Um, but you're the decision maker at the end of the day. Um, you, we don't get to make any decisions on the cover. Um, we no matter say, no matter how much I try and push you into giving me an opinion. <laughs> <laughs> you can never listen anyway. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, yeah, so, um, just, well, I don't know what I was saying. Sorry. Um, bring you on ideas. Yeah, bring you on ideas because we want to hear them. You, you are going to make all the decisions at the end of the day. We would like you to listen to our advice because... Hopefully you're not just getting a designer for someone to move pixels around in Photoshop just because we know how to use Photoshop. Because like genuinely we have we've probably done two thousand covers or more. We've received masses of feedback on um things that have worked over the years, things that haven't worked so well, um, things that have sold better. We have an author who's sold over a million books, which blo- blows my mind. Um he he writes at an incredible rate. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he's a great guy. But some books that we've done from have worked, some haven't worked as well. And we've got all that kind of experience. We spend too much time in bookshops drinking coffee, looking at covers. Um, so don't like, we're perfectly happy for you to say, do this as I want it. But also, you're kind of paying for the other stuff too. So use it. Amazing. So what, and I think that segues nicely into the next question, which is what what mistakes do authors make when trying to work with designers? You or me? Me? You? Whatever. Do you want to rest? <laughs> Oops. <laughs> shut up, isn't it? Okay. No. <laughs> I need more couples on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> it's very entertaining. Um, so I think a lot, sometimes an author can make a mistake where they don't read the quote properly. Um they they think they're getting they've got in their head that they're getting maybe it's custom illustration and then all of a sudden it's a shock when it's not custom illustration like read, read the quote properly I think and you're not going to get custom illustration of photography for you know the prices that we charge like it costs a lot of money to do that and it's a very specific skill as well illustration I, yeah I, I don't think there are lots of illustrators who wouldn't do cover design I would never think to do illustration because I can't draw for toffee it's not interchangeable yeah um so make sure you're getting um and I think if, if you do that then you're starting on the same page um as the designer if, if you if you're not reading it properly what you're getting then you don't know if you've been diddled you don't know if you're getting what you need and then it just leads to problems down the line. And if someone does want illustration, we know some great illustrators we can point yeah, people to again, as well. We, we, if we don't know the answer, we can very often point you to someone who does. Yeah. And I think just to add to that, when you, I think authors need to be clear. So for example, with my um, young adult novels, I had symbols illustrated. Mm. And I went to a specific illustrator for that, which I then gave to you guys to then yeah. design the covers for. But you have to be absolutely clear with the illustrator for, you know, license purposes and copyright and all of that yeah. stuff. You have to make sure that you are clear with your illustrator what those illustrations are then going to be used for because God forbid you sign any contracts or anything with, with somebody and then you don't have the right to use them in the way that you want to. Um, so I think that's really important there. And also how the big, we have a, um, a small publisher who we do quite a few covers for and a lot of those are illustrated children's books. And the illustrators they use are great because they know that they need to leave certain spaces within that illustration for the typography on the cover and everything to breathe really well. And you just know when you get an illustration from those people that they know exactly what they're doing and they're, they're worth the weight and gold a good illustrator. Yeah. For me, that's process. For me, one of the big things, um, a, a mistake an author might make is um, they can get a bit lost in the woods with a design. Um, and I think it's entirely understandable um, because you know your book, like I was saying, inside and out. Um, it's your baby. You've sometimes spent more time with it than some people spend with the actual babies from what I can get. <laughs> um, and so you've got these 
these details that are really close to your heart and understandable, but in lots of cases, that detail is really, really not important to your cover. Mm. And sometimes we have those conversations where we need to say, I can see why this is important for this character or this plot line or whatever, mm. but no, that's not going to help you sell books. And like cover design is like the dirty part of book, of the whole book business. Um, it's just sort of like trying to, you're trying to get people to read your words, and the best way of doing that is presenting them with something, showing the reader that you respect them by presenting them with something that really appeals to them. And um, yeah, getting down and dirty and selling, that's what your cover's about. And it's some, sometimes there's some hard decisions for an author to make in that. Mm. And on mm. those decisions, I think another mistake people make is they're trying to sign by committee. So mm -hmm. we'll give them a couple of concepts, and they're like, oh my God, I really love these. Um, and then they'll take them away and discuss them with their granny and their next door neighbor's cat. And they'll come back because they've asked for an opinion. People feel like they should give an opinion and they look for stuff and they come back and say, well, actually, can you completely change it? And when I put you loved it, um, I, th I think sometimes you kind of it's, it's great sort of asking for feedback. I think sometimes I think but, feedback can be great. Yeah. But when, when you then sort of don't then trust your basic instinct and your like how you how your gut reaction was to the cover, yeah. then it can yeah. get in the way a lot. Because a time. cover a cover works when on gut reactions most of the time. Um, a cover will be analysed after the fact, but when someone's making a decision on whether or not to pick up a book either virtually or in a bookstore, the analysis will come later. It's like, does this cover make you want to pick that book up? Once it's done that, you read the blurb, you read a few pages, and then you're really really into the chance that you're going to buy the book. But the cover is really, really about good instincts. And it's sort of like a 10,000 foot view that we need to get from you through the brief to say, this is the key thing we need to get across in this cover. We don't tell the story on the cover, we evoke the story on the cover. Mm -hmm. um, we always try and drill that home to clients in, in Basecamp. So sort of the online thing that we use. Yes, and I uh, completely agree about the committee decision making. I definitely made this mistake earlier on in my uh, like self publishing journey. I was asking too many people and then getting confused about the opinions and then not feeling empowered to make my own decisions. And I think I've only learned by trial and error that um, a I try to now ask readers of the genre rather than necessarily asking fellow writer friends. Um, yeah. I tend to ask the people who are actually reading the genre whether or not the cover appeals to them. And then I may or may not listen to that advice. <laughs> but I think that, you know, confidence and ability to go with your gut does only come over time. And, you know, that building confidence in your own business and, and yourself yeah. and your business uh, decisions. But for anybody listening, go with your gut. Feel confident. Are there any other mistakes that writers make um, when working with cover designers? I think one that we get surprisingly often, which isn't a lot, but a few times a year we'll say it, is people who, you might look to try to redefine a genre or oh, yes. um, even to create a genre and um, just leave that to the publishing houses if that's what they're probably not interested in doing that. But um, you've got an ability, being a self-publisher, to get to your readership and offer what they want. And then if you're trying to put obstacles in the way, like a cover that breaks the mold or something, we can do that and it can be really arty, but I'm not really sure it's gonna help you sell books. And that's the main thing you're paying us for, is to help you get your book in front of people and reading that. Um, so yeah, don't try to redefine a genre, I think would be yeah. my other main thing. Yeah, that's actually quite a common thing because we, I think that's maybe it's more common than you've sort of said there. When we have that question in the, the in the briefing um, for, for genre, a lot of people will sort of say it doesn't fit in any genre, and like it will. It may, maybe it's literary fiction, so it's not an obvious thriller or romance or something. That's fine, but it will fit in a genre. And if it doesn't fit in a genre, people probably aren't going to buy it because they won't know about it. And it's important, I think, to have that discussion, but for the author, either with us or with someone else, because. It's another example where I don't think we would be helping if we just said, "Okay, um, you can again." That's, you can people can take or leave that advice, and they need to make the decisions, and that's really really important. But it is important for an author to think through that about who am I writing this for? Obviously, you're writing it for yourself, but who am I trying to get to read my work? Yeah. Um, and for those who are writing across genre, don't start panicking. <laughs> Oh, no, 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 no
yeah you can have elements of more than one genre in, in a book cover yeah yeah um it's just yeah different thing okay so do you guys have a favorite cover you've designed or perhaps a favorite genre of covers feel obliged to say mine no i'm joking <laughs> definitely <laughs> sasha black yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah no <laughs> Um, no, I'm your favourite client. There's a difference. <laughs> actually, I really loved working on images for your um, new YA. Can oh, yes. Yeah, The Scent of Death. Yeah, so yeah. The, I haven't revealed the cover, um, okay. but uh, the lamppost saga continues on Instagram. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that I, uh, so people do know that I'm writing it, but um, I just haven't revealed the cover yet. Okay. Yeah, that was good fun. Um, but honestly, I think this question is another example of how evil you are. Because it's like asking us to choose our favourite child, which is probably the next question. No, I found it crazy, actually. Uh, okay, yeah. Well, you're the evil one out of us, too. That's, that's true. <laughs> no, honestly, I couldn't choose a favourite cover. It tends to be genuinely... If I'm working on a cover, the point I was talking about organically working on, the point at which you start to feel, oh, yes, this is working, then that'll be my favourite for, like, that day. Mm -hmm. um, but looking back, um, I genuinely... I wouldn't, like... I couldn't. What about genre? Sorry. Genre, yeah. I yeah. love literary fiction because I think you can really get something that's a bit different and you can kind of get your teeth into that. Mm -hmm. And you can look for something a bit more unexpected with literary fiction. Um, I think there's just a little bit more potential there to kind of be creative and look for something mm -hmm. that maybe the author didn't... Uh, what I really like is the bit where um, Andrew sends over a concept and the author's like, wow, I didn't expect that, but it's, it really works. And I find that happens quite a lot with literary fiction because it's just like an extra sort of layer you're sort of getting there. Mm. Um, and also crime and thriller, they're really good ones to work on because there's like a proper genre expectation for those kind of covers. There's a style that works. And when you get it, when when you nail it, it it's really, it really works. Yeah. Um, so I really like those. Yeah, I like those. I like, um, I love working on, YA books because you tend there's something about YA which I don't know it has a kind of yeah. a conceptual or creative element to the covers that you I love working on crime fiction things there's, a, there's something really good about a good crime fiction cover but with YA you can get more conceptual with it um YA so is I, not afraid to tackle big issues and big sort of mm, themes yeah yeah so you, that really works so sorry, that isn't one fifth. No, that's fine. No, that's fine. I mean, that's like asking somebody to choose their favourite book. You're always going to get five or ten answers, so it's yeah. <laughs> fine. Um, <clears throat> what are the elements of good cover design? Obviously, lots of um, the listeners aren't going to be creating their own uh, book covers, but they should be looking at the work that designers are giving them and be able to at least have the knowledge to know what uh, the good elements are in a cover that they should be looking for so good elements like you want a good and appropriate use of typography you don't want like times new roman comic sans like that kind of thing you don't like your, your stock fonts that you get on any laptop you want something that's obviously been done by a professional and you want the typography to be something appropriate so you don't want like swirly loops for a crime book i mean that's that's possibly obvious i'm not sure but yeah so a good use of typography. Can I add something on that? No. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I love um, this so much. On the typography question, I think um, if there was one thing, I know you, what you said, people listening to this hope I'm doing their own covers, but also I know some people are, maybe budget doesn't extend to it. And obviously I want people to go to a designer and if they do, I want them to come to us. But if for whatever reason you're putting together your own cover or you're looking at covers in advance of going to a designer, then with typography, um, just kind of, it is the most important. Sometimes we'll have people come to us where they've been elsewhere, had a cover done, and they come to us saying, it's all wrong, it's a mess, and you look at it, and it's really not. It's just that the typography is wrong. Um, it's a single thing that can lift and sink a cover if you get that wrong. When we were working on your new book, I had a list of 40, 50 fonts. Yeah. I think I even sent it to you on the back of the You did. Oh, you did. Awesome. <laughs> Um, and yeah, you were just going through and trying, trying, trying. Yeah, and you try loads of different things and you narrow it down and you see what works. But if you are in a position where you're putting together your own cover, then I would actually say, then do pull back. Don't try and add all sorts of effects yeah, and yeah. add things to it. Do pull back to the classic fonts and use them and use them sparingly and lightly because 
if you do that, then what you are going to benefit from is that genius is working design on that fund. Do you mm-hmm. know what I mean? Um, there are some f- classic funds which you can use, use them lightly, and it will do far more for your cover than trying to add them with a flourish or twist them or do a bit of word art or whatever. Um, I've seen a, a presentation where somebody put a cover up that they've designed uh, with one typography on it, which made it mm-hmm. very much one genre i think it might have been crime or something and then they replaced the typography with a science fiction typography Mm -hmm. and all of a sudden it was the same cover everything else was exactly the same but it really did turn it into a science fiction um cover and i was just sat there aghast because i was like how can one tiny element yeah. completely radically change a genre but it can so i think yeah i think that's absolutely right typography is um vital it makes me laugh because actually i think on the scent of death that was one of the last things that that got fixed got that was settled on yeah that was settled on exactly it was the it was the font of, in the end i think we were just then changing like the shade of white god not that i'm really picky or a nightmare to work with but you know <laughs> um so yeah typography is like yeah yeah and um, cohesion. So um, we, we don't do custom illustration. We have like a, a, a library of images that we use. And people sort of might, their gut reaction to that might be, what? Um, but that there's, most publishing houses probably will use some stock, type, uh, stock, stock illustration, stock photography. But if it's used well by someone who knows what they're doing, like Andrew, then it doesn't look like it's a stock image anymore. So... For Wait. most books, um, we're using we've got access to the same images that the publishers have, and to some extent, on both sides of the scent, both sides of that fence, because we do white label work for publishers as well as work directly with authors, authors like yourself as well. So we, you, the images, apart from in some cases, come from the exact same places, places like Shutterstock or iStock, and yeah. the, the quality of images you have there is part of what kind of democratised publishing is things like that, which means that people can get a really good quality cover, good typography, good imagery, at a cost which isn't something ridiculous. And good composition, and good composition. which is the, the sort of thing I was trying to say yeah. there, because um, they are great images, but they need to be put together properly. Yeah. And you can't just plonk a good image on top of another good image, because it'll look plonked. Yeah. Um, it needs to be like, it needs to be a cohesive, composed whole thing. And then you kind of filter the image, you'll process it, you'll do things with it, and that's when you start to feel it coming together. That's that exciting part of the cover design I was talking about earlier, Mm. when that all happens. Um, There's also, um, I think behind all that, it's just remembering that it is your, you touched on this earlier, Sasha, it's it's your number one marketing tool for that book. Um, It's the thing you're gonna um, gonna base any promotional materials on, which we also do, by the way. I mean, it's often your avatar on social media, isn't it? Yeah, people use it as an avatar. So behind everything, remember that when you're getting this cover design done, this is going to be sort of like almost your face for however long you're promoting this book and beyond until the next one comes up. Um, so that's a little bit kind of off topic, but it's really yeah. important. Um, okay, so what should authors expect from a cover design service? I know that um, I have been in trouble with... Um, prior design services, being ripped off, learnt the lessons the hard way. Um, but what what advice would you give to um, a new author or even, you know, someone with more experience um, in order to prevent them from being ripped off by a dodgy service? And we all know, unfortunately, there are plenty of services out there willing to rip authors off. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I would say, first of all, kind of what Beck was saying earlier, be careful about what you are signing up for. Look at what the package yeah, includes. The um, look around the website. Um, get some testimonials. Mm. Um, ask them to. You can ask a, a designer if you can hear from some of the clients that they've worked with. Yeah. Um, and some clients are happy to sort of send an email or something like that. Um, but yeah, because there are some out there who will offer package deals, and package deals aren't in themselves bad. Um, we've got a couple of packages that we offer, but we put a lot of thought into exactly what's included. But if you're going to someone who's going to get you to the top of Google with a thousand five star reviews, and we're going to throw in your editing and your cover yeah, and your layout and the website, then can they really do all of those things well? Um, it's not likely. Over, yeah. We've like developed over the time 
we've been doing this over a decade, there's three things that we do. We do book design, we do web design, and we do marketing materials, and it's all based on the same core skill that we have that we think we can do well. We've got another service coming later this year, which we've invested in a lot over a few years to get in a position to be able to offer it. Um, but Which is, can you tell us, this no, wonderful new service, or is it secret still? No, not yet. Okay. <laughs> Just, I don't, we, we wouldn't want to offer anything to any client which we didn't feel really confident we could do and do well and feel that they would want to tell other people about. Mm -hmm. So if you're signing up to something that's offering you everything, like if you go to a takeaway and you can get a Chinese and Indians, a pizza, a kebab, a fish and chips, and everything, they're not going to do everything in there well. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So be careful with what you're signing up for, that you're not signing up to some sort of impossible dream. Mm. Yeah. If it's too good to be true or it looks too good to be true, then it definitely is. Yeah. Yeah. And often those prices will feel inflated as well, I've found. Sometimes they'll charge a crazy low price, but often those prices are just crazy inflated as well. Mm. Okay. Um, and, I, 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 sorry, I would just also say if you're wanting to about not getting diddled or ripped off, maybe look carefully at the payment terms. Yeah. Um, so there are lots of really legitimate designers who take a fifty percent deposit, or whatever. I'm not yeah. like knocking that at all. We don't take any money until everything's like completely done and happy and signed off, and that's really paid off for us over the years. I think. Yeah. But I think if anyone's asking for like the money up front or most of the money up front, I think I would be sort of looking around for something else. Which doesn't mean at all that anyone who's doing that is necessarily Absolutely bad. Absolutely not, definitely. Because I know good designers who do but that. It is something that I would be looking into um, if yeah. I was looking around for something. I would say it's like anything. Look for someone you want to build a relationship. Look for someone who will answer your questions. Um, someone you can trust. Um, obviously, we all want to be paid for the work that we do, but... Someone who's got a little bit of an interest in what it is you're trying to achieve beyond just the check coming in at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, yeah, look, look for someone you want to build a relationship with long term because that's the ideal for us. If we can have authors like yourself and we have a lot who like we can we have a laugh with them and none of them are as mad as you, but that's no. fine. <laughs> <laughs> we have a laugh with them and it, it's really fun going to work if there's people and you're doing more covers for the same person because yeah. the, the, the previous one has worked well and it's an, an enjoyable experience to, to go to work. Yeah, we had one client who, um, they had a pig featured on their cover and they ended up coming back, when they're still with us, they come back year after year after year. And we spent about three months, I think, in an email conversation just basically exchanging pig puns. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. It just it was part of that relationship building. It's a lot of fun as well. I guess you. Yeah, you kind of. I think you kind of know if there's somebody that you're going to feel comfortable working with. So I don't know. I guess there's a lot of good involved in that as well. Batman or Superman? Yeah. Superman. No. Superman. <laughs> Batman. This is also <laughs> for listeners. Who, <laughs> yeah, who have no idea what we're talking about. We have a long running. <laughs> We have a long running dispute about which which uh, which character is the best. It's clearly Batman. It's my podcast. It's Batman today. <laughs> yeah. No, I quite... yes, and look, you just said it as well. You got some nifty uh, audio editing there. No, I do. I'm, I'm probably going to get hate tweets now for people who are massive Superman fans. Um, okay, cheeky question. Do you think we should judge a book by its cover? Absolutely. Of course. No, <laughs> I would no. say that. <laughs> Not actually. Um, yeah, to a certain extent, because you, you, you're going to buy a book based on the cover and the blurb, and you're not going to really get to the blurb if you don't like the cover to pick it up in the first place. So kind of yes, actually. Um, I, yeah, I think inevitably before your book's read, um, people are, the only thing people have to judge your, to judge your book immediately is the cover. That's kind of like there'll, there'll be reviews, they might have read about it, but generally the only thing people have to judge your book is your cover and people will make snap judgments. And then whether or not you as the author is the sort of people, person who makes a snap judgment, some of the people you want to read your book and you want people to read your book are going to make those judgments. So why kind of rule those people out when you can easily sort of like wipe that obstacle out of the way by presenting something which makes the, read, the potential reader feel like you respect them that you've gone to the time to present your work well and to present it in a way which will appeal to them as your your likely readers. Yeah. And like, if you're going to buy a book, whether it's a 99p Kindle book 
or a fourteen ninety nine hardcover, you invest. You're not just investing that ninety nine p or the fourteen ninety nine. You're investing a lot of time. Um, sometimes you're investing a lot of emotion. I mean, there are books that get me sobbing at the end of them. You 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 put a lot of yourself in as a reader, and you don't want to be let down by an inappropriate cover, or you want to be enticed as well by a good cover. Yeah. So, yeah. I think once people have read the book, then the cover becomes like entirely secondary. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But and they'll judge your book by your your words, which is way way better. But you you want people to be you want that's the whole reason you're writing a book. You want people to read your words. You've got this great idea you want to share. So get as many people in and. Yeah, your cover is it's an advert and uh, it's an invitation. Yeah. And like you don't want to send a crappy invite to your wedding. Um, people will still come. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and very few people sell a book just based on their name. Yeah. You know, like you 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 want some reason to pick the book up. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think. So yeah, people will, and that's sad, but people will. So why rule those people out? Yeah. No. Absolutely. Um. Okay. This is the Rebel Author Podcast. So, <laughs> tell me about a time you unleashed your inner rebel. Um, I thought sod it and let myself be talked into appearing on a podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Eventually. Um, and for me, I, well, I guess it's this whole venture. Um, we had given up full time work, and you might you will sort of understand this as well. Given up full time work and something that you always wanted to do but you've got a home you've got two children um small at the time very small children two small children it's the height of a recession we've just had a credit crunch i know what i'm gonna go self-employed and (laughs) it's either sort of rebellious or irresponsible or entirely stupid or brilliantly inspired or a mix of them all but combination yeah that's probably it quite boring really (laughs) no I don't think it is and I think that so much of being an indie or being in the indie like self-publishing arena wherever you are in that arena is about rebellion and independence and empowerment actually because not everybody can be self-employed not everybody can run a business it really does and I I'm sure not everybody's gonna like hearing that but it does take a particular type of person and a particular mindset in order to succeed in this in this world and if you don't take any risks then you you know you're never going to grow you're never going to have these opportunities to create the business so yeah the biggest shock for me i'm not off topic but when starting a business the biggest shock was i'd always wanted to have a design business but i'd never thought about like really thinking about accounts and systems and processes and all and you spend so much time working on those and developing them and trying to improve them. And it's like, ah, didn't think of that part. But as as it grows, it kind of like, this is really soppy and trite sounding, but we have two children and Design for Writers feels like our third child because so much time has gone on it and so much care um, that you kind of go to love, even all of those parts that yes. you didn't set it up for in the first place. So if anyone's thinking about it, then yeah, go for it. Absolutely. Unless you want to be a cover designer, in which case, don't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you rebel. Um, okay, tell listeners where they can find out more about you and your covers and your company. Um, well, first place to go is designforwriters.com, which is our website. and um, Design for the has... number or design for the word? So The word. The website is designforwriters, kind of no spaces, dot com. Um, which is where you can find information on our services and there's more Access stuff already ready behind the scenes to roll out. It took us years to even get our own website up, um, but it's up there now. Um, on Twitter, it's design number four writers because they only allow 15 characters in your name. Um, on Facebook, it is design for writers, all one word, the word for. And are we on Instagram or Pinterest or anything like that? We're on Pinterest, but not don't really use it all that often right. so might have that out. and we're not on instagram yet and there's all sorts of modern things that kids do like tiktok and snapchat, snapchat. and um okay now you're sounding older <laughs> <laughs> yeah i don't know what i mean so 
Uh, well, thank you so much to both Becca and Andrew for being my guests on the Rebel Author Podcast today. Thank you very much to all of the patrons supporting the show. If you would like to get early access to all of the episodes, as well as bonus material, blooper reels, and uh, blogs and content, then you can do so by visiting www.patreon.com forward slash Sasha Black. And that is Sasha with a C and not an S. Thank you to everybody listening. I'm Sasha Black. You were listening to Becca and Andrew Brown. And this was the Rebel Author Podcast. Next week, I am going to be talking to Daniel Parsons. Daniel is a longtime friend of mine uh, who I met, I think, think either at the London Book Fair or at one of the Ally after parties and he is going to be talking about networking for authors especially introverts and um, people who may be socially uncomfortable or shy and it is a fantastic episode chock full of tips so look out for that next week. Don't forget to tune in and subscribe on your podcatcher and when you have a moment please leave a review.